Hello and welcome. My name is Anita Kress and I am the webinar production assistant for Dataversity. Thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Lessons in Data Modeling with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss data modeling for XML and JSON. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, uh, you will um, be muted uh, during the webinar. And we very much encourage you to chat with us and each other through the webinar. To do so, click the chat icon on the top right corner of the screen to activate that feature. For questions, we will be collecting them through the Q&A section. If um, you would like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag lessons data modeling. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the recording of this session and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce our speaker, Donna Burbank. She is a recognized industry leader, um, an expert in information management with over 20 years of experience in data management, metadata management, and enterprise architecture. She currently is Managing Director of Global Data Strategy, an international data management consulting company. Her background is multifaceted across consulting, product development, product management, brand strategy, marketing, and business leadership. She has worked with dozens of Fortune um, 500 companies worldwide in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, and speaks regularly at conferences. So uh, at this moment, thank you, Donna, for speaking with us today, and I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Anita. It's always great to speak at Dataversity. Uh, and so, as Anita mentioned, today's topic is data modeling for XML and JSON, which is a little different from some of the other topics um, we have had. Um, I'll go through some of the topics later. Anita already mentioned me, and I think many of you know me already. Uh, so probably most relevant to this discussion today, some of you know me from past roles, either on the ER Studio team, uh, where I was director of product management, um, or uh, with the Irwin team, where I was a VP of product marketing. So kind of had a lot of experience in the data modeling space, um, both on the technical and the strategic, and uh, wanted to kind of address that today and kind of some of the well, I don't say new when it comes to XML, but some of the you know non-traditional, non-relational areas when it comes to data management. Um, this is, we see, this is a number of the, the last this year in the series. Um, so if you haven't joined some of the others, they are all available on demand. And you'll see that we tried to, to mix it up a little bit in terms of topics. We started out with data modeling as part of your data strategy. Um, we have things on data modeling and metadata management, big data, UML. Um, and this one gets a little more in the nitty gritty of XML and JSON at the end. Uh, keep you keep you wondering till the end, but we have a whole lineup for next year as well, where we try to do the same thing, kind of some bottom up and some top down. Um, and then we try to judge by the attendance what are kind of the more popular ones. So um, definitely, you know, if, if there is something that by the end that you don't see in the agenda, do let us know, because we try to always go by feedback of what's been interesting to folks. Um, so and today on the agenda, we're going to talk specifically about uh, XML and JSON, if you're not familiar with that technology, what it means uh, with things like data modeling and metadata for XML and JSON, and then what it means to sort of integrate some of these technologies with databases. When I mean databases, it isn't always relational databases, right? So we have um, NoSQL databases as well. And then a little bit, which is still modeling, uh, if you're familiar with things like RDF and the semantic web and how things like XML might fill in, uh, fit into that before we uh, open it up to Q&A. Um, but before I go too much further, um, I told you a little bit about myself and you heard a little bit about me, but it's always awkward on these webinars because I can't see you. And I do recognize some of the names, the familiar faces, I guess, um, uh, on the webinar, but some of you I don't know. So we have a couple questions just so I can kind of level set in the presentation. Anita, would you be able to kind of bring those up or Shannon, I'm not sure who's running in the back, um, kind of the poll questions? Anyone? I can run one at a time so we can answer this way I've got it set up. Okay. I don't see it. Should I be seeing it or do I need to click on it? Here we go. This is the oh, first okay. one. Okay. Uh, the first one is, um, how familiar are you with relational data modeling or edited relationship modeling, ER, kind of the boxes and lines? So there's three buttons there if you want to just uh, give a vote. 
and let me know, Shannon. Oh, there's a time. We have 22 seconds left before we can show. I think we can all see the results when they're ready. And Shannon, are they opened up, or do I have to? We have to wait longer. I don't know if I should be seeing something. Yeah, this is where it's it's closed and it's taking time to. Oh, this submit. is where I sing. I would <laughs> sing. No one would ever come back. It would not now we be. need the Jeopardy music. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but my assumption here is that this will be high um, because generally, and this was sort of my assumption building the presentation. A lot of folks on these data modeling webinars are data modelers. Funny that. Um, or data architects, and it looks like we were proven right. Um, so you know, most of you folks are pretty familiar with the relational world, uh, which isn't a surprise. That's kind of the data diversity core, and especially when we come to a data modeling series. Um, uh, you know, a lot of folks are familiar with that. When we look into XML, I don't know if Shannon, if you could pull up that one. Same thing. Um, are you how familiar you are are you with the, the XML technologies, or you know whether you've coded it, whether you've heard of it, and don't know what it is? Um, you know. Uh, be honest here, because no one else can see your answers but you. We do not catalog these in any way. So, I have my thoughts on this one, but I will wait to be surprised. And that's, you know, it's always good to know. And I saw some folks didn't vote last time. That's not allowed. You must vote. See what they come out to this time. All right, the poll is sorting. It's adding to the suspense. <laughs> I would sing, but really, that no one would ever come back. <laughs> you should sing, Sam, but Shannon's sick. Shannon's a singer, if anyone didn't know that. I want the cat out of the bag now. My voice is not there today. All right. <laughs> okay. uh, it's a little bit of a mix. Some folks are very familiar, uh, somewhat, um, and then some are not familiar, and some are still shy and refuse to answer. But so you shall be punished for that. For the next one, you have to answer. Uh, but that was my assumption too. I think a lot of folks that are familiar with relational modeling um, maybe aren't as familiar with XML, uh, and vice versa. So to bring up the very last one, Shannon, uh, we're going to ask a similar thing about JSON. Um, is JSON something you're familiar with? Again, have worked with, have heard of, um, or not? Uh, so again, don't be shy. We don't publish these to Twitter. Oh, I saw somebody we did post to Twitter. Joe doesn't know anything about JSON. No, just kidding. We do not do that. Uh, just more, you know, as I go through, I, I kind of want to know what people's backgrounds are as I ramble along. It's always good to know the audience a little bit. And on that note, I neglected to say on the um, on the intro slide, I will go back to that. If anyone is a Twitter person, there is a hashtag today, uh, hashtag lessons DM. Um, so if there is something that you're, you know, either questions or comments or something from the presentation you want to share, uh, there is a hashtag on Twitter as well. Um, and I guess this is a long, long poll. They need a better data model behind so they can... <laughs> <laughs> calculate the queries faster. I think there's some people on the call that could help with that. All right, similar. Um, um, that some folks are somewhat familiar with it, um, some folks is new to them, uh, a few folks are um, kind of very familiar with it. So it's a bit of a mix. Um, not sure if the same people who are familiar with XML were also familiar with JSON, but don't worry, we will not have you do another poll. But thank you for doing that. That uh, helps me a little bit just to make sure that we're you know hitting the right target. So see if I got it right. Uh, on the next slide, my assumption uh, was that most people on the call today are familiar with relational databases in ER. So yes, there are cartoons about data modeling, and this is one from my first book, uh, Data Modeling for the Business, with Steve Hoberman and Chris Bradley. Um, that some people read data models to their kids to put them to sleep. I think Steve Hoberman is probably one of them. I think he has stories where his uh, child was in kindergarten doing data models. Um, but he's probably the, the exception, not the rule. Um, but again, yeah, often on these webinars, there's a heavy, heavy focus on data modelers, data architects, et cetera. So the examples I'm going to give in this presentation have that bias, i.e. a comparison with the relational database world. And I know that's a, an assumption, um, but I went with it. So this is not, um, and, and fine, if, if you want to leave after you hear this, but this is not going to be a deep dive into the technical aspects of JSON and all the different options of modeling it, et cetera, which are, there are webinars on that, and that's a fine topic. I thought, um, as we put through this agenda, it would be a good introduction to some folks that are familiar with um, relational databases, but maybe not so familiar with JSON and XML, or you might be familiar with them, but kind of want some thoughts or conversation on how they might fit together. So, 
So here we go. What is XML? So I'm sure you've heard the term accessible markup language. It's really used to store and transport data. Um, and it's a very simple definition. And it was really designed on the on the concept of simplicity. So some of the basic design principles of XML when it was created was this idea of simplicity, right? So the fact that if I can make it easy to use, if it can interoperate with everything else and easy to understand, then it's going to be, you know, taken up in the market. And well, it's lasted, what, 20 years now? It's been around for quite a long time. So I think it succeeded in that. The other thing is this idea of modular design to do one thing well. And it's you know, the one thing it is supposed to do is data availability, transport, and sharing, right? So that is its purpose. Don't overload it with other things. So if you go to the bottom um, bullet, you know, what it doesn't do is format the information. That's what HTML is for. It doesn't transport the data. That's what something like a web service is for. It doesn't necessarily design to store it with, with large, you know, legacy amounts of information. That's where you may use a, a database. So it is what it is. It does one thing well, and it does it very well. Um, the other idea is to make it extensible, so you can easily modify the structure and content, and also self-descriptive. So not only can it be machine-readable, but a human can read it. And if you've ever opened up an XML file, I'm sure you can basically understand it, because it has these things called you know, an embedded descriptive tag. And we'll talk more about this. This was a pretty big deal, especially when it first came out. Think of things like object-oriented programming, or, or you know, some of the designs at the time where you're mixing the code, oh, still around, but you know, stick, mixing the code directly um, with the data, or things like the mainframe, where it's a big top-down you know, design. This was pretty revolutionary. And I actually, um, in preparation for this, did some research that we'll talk about in a bit. But the big idea here is that it exists with things like data exchange, right? So if they give a B2B or a B2C, I have a company sending a purchase order to another company, or you're buying off the web, right? Or I'm a, a research organization, I want to sharing information. It's that way to be kind of um, you, you, the ubiquitous exchanger of information, which again, we take for granted so much now, um, but it really was pretty revolutionary at the time. So if you were on my big data webinar, um, I talked about the same theory in a slightly different context. I'm sort of a fan of it, so bear with me, um, because it was a, way, a change in the way of, of my thinking. So if you're familiar with this idea of emergence, um, and philosophy, not to get philosophical, but I tend to do that on some of these webinars. Um, so there's this idea of the fact that complex systems and patterns can arise out of a multiplicity of relatively simple interactions. Uh, so let's think of a snowflake, right? There's all these different um, facets of a snowflake or crystals that form together to cre create this larger thing that we pretty much quickly look at and say, okay, that's a snowflake. But no two snowflakes are exactly the same. If you look at the snowflakes in the picture, they're all vastly different. But they're all made up of similar components. And you know, religion aside, there was no one person that decided that I'm going to design a snowflake. They just sort of appear, right? And and this bothers me, actually. It did bother me um, in my previous presentation that you may have heard, so I won't go too much into it. You know, I think it's comfortable for us to say if we can just design it and, and we understand the world with something like the periodic table of elements and we can organize it everything as well. But the more we look into some things with nature, it does seem to be a chaotic mix of things that mesh together of, of, of trial and error and, be, and create beautiful things like a snowflake. Well, the idea behind the internet, really, or things like XML, is very similar to that. Just do one thing well. I share data. When you think of something like the internet, the, the ability to share data across these disparate systems across the globe in a very simple uh, way is actually a big deal. So I think I mentioned when I went back to do this presentation and was doing some research for some of my books, oh, from like 1990-something or early 2000s, and they were talking about the revolution of data and this idea that you could actually order something online and it shipped to your house. You know, things that we're doing now and don't even think of, you know, and you can thank things like XML because it is very modular and it helps something very simple to do that data exchange across organizations. So it was also kind of cool because it, it, the, the way they read was very similar to some of the things we're seeing now in, in the press with because we like to make big deals about things. You know, the Internet of Things or big data and... You know, they, they were right back then. You know, a lot of the stuff that they say was going to happen um, did. So who knows what's going to be here 10 years from now when we do a data diversity webinar on the new topic. But it's just kind of a different way of thinking of it, this modularity of data to, to, to share. Uh, so back to XML itself. So a little different than you might think with a, a relational database. It uses a hierarchical structure or a tree structure. So here's an example of one. Um, where this might be, you know, a purchase order, where you can see, um, pretty, again, you may never have seen XML before, um, but if you haven't, you still could understand it. So, funnily enough, there's a ship to address, 
with a name that's John Smith, who has an address, a city, and a country. And it's sort of uh, labeled with these different tags. So there's different uh, nesting. So you know the ship due address, that's going to be your root element. And then you have these child elements. Um, if you can almost think of that, a parent-child relationship similar in a relational data model. Um, the other nice thing about it is it's extensible. And for some of you folks, we'll talk later, but when you think of things like document databases, there's a similar theme here. Um, so the idea is, you know, I, I have the ship to address, but maybe I didn't know everything at the time, right? So I have a name, address, city, but you'll notice there's no state in that. So the one on the right, we've added a state um, so that I know that this is Boise, Idaho, and not Boise, Utah. Um, the nice thing is that any programs that have been looking at that, the original version will still work. You can sort of do this additive thing. So, you know, it's not like you have a relational database and you need to get the DBA to add the column. And, you know, there's pros and cons to each. Um, but that is one of the nice things about it is that it's extensible because you're basically matching on these um, the element names. The other nice thing is that it's self-describing. And I say sort of because I'm a metadata and data modeling geek, and we'll kind of you know clarify that. But it is. I mean, the nice, the one nice thing is it's human readable. You can open up an XML file that's in text, and basically understand that this is a ship to address with a name, address, city, country. You know, fairly self-descriptive, um, and they, they do describe the content of the element. So you know, if I didn't know that John Smith is the name, it tells me. You know, the city is Boise. It's pretty obvious that's a city. But if we're true data modelers, which many of you on the call are. It really doesn't provide the full metadata. So what's the data type of Boise? Does that need to be a string? Is it a character 10 field? You know, address, is that broken up? Uh, is one a numeric field, et cetera, et cetera? What's the business definition? What do we mean by name? Is that customer name? Is that the ship to name that the, might be a gift? You know, what's the business definition of these different um, fields? You know, is name required? All these kind of things that you might have uh, in a traditional metadata you know, tool or a, a database that kind of where these things or data model where these things are defined it isn't but you know we'll talk about this later that's not really its purpose it's just sharing some you know quick data across but it does not fulfill that full metadata around it it does have metadata um, you don't need to um, but people do and it's a good best practice you know similar to DDL you have what's called an XML schema or an XSD um, that helps define the structure and format of the, uh, the data, which is basically metadata. So a little different, when you look at the data, which I'm saying is actually the XML file here in the middle, as I kill my presentation, um, in a way it, that can be a little bit confusing because you're saying, well, that's actually some metadata in there too, because you do have kind of the name, address, et cetera, but that really is your raw data. The metadata on the left with the XSD, that helps you kind of define the structure. So you can say here that a name is a string type and a city is a string. But you're kind of noticing a lot of strings. You know, it doesn't really have the full data typing, you know, that we may be familiar with in the data modeling world. Um, and then the other piece of the data piece is that there's actually an order shipment here, right? That, that's actually what you're doing here. You have a ship to address for this person that you're sending some data to. Um, so a little bit of, of the different information between uh, data and metadata in these different fields. Okay, you can also show it in a model, and then maybe I'm the, uh, the same way. I think we can be sloppy. I, but when I'm talking about a model, I, I kind of want to see a box and a line, right? <laughs> I tend to be a, a visual person, um, and I like to see physical diagrams of things. And it can do that as well. So if here's an example of an XML schema on the left. That's almost like your DDL that you might render into an ER diagram. Similar thing. So this is a, a web description of a literary work on the internet. Uh, so your resource could be anything, right? It could be a web page. It could be a document. It could be a blog. Uh, so you have the resource here. And then with this graph, see, I don't know, on the left is fine. You might be a text-based person. You could read through that and see that you have um, yeah, I can't even seem to grab it here somewhere. You're pointing it to it. There's a resource, right? And you can go through and see that resource has a title and a URL and a description. Right? To me, that's a, it has an indication, and, and that's fine. To me, that's a little hard to read. I like to see it on the right, where you can still say that there's a resource that has a title and a URL description with an author that it might have a first name, last name, et cetera. And it can parse it out. Um, and there's different tools that can do this. I generally don't like to talk too much about tools to keep this better neutral. Um, but just because people will ask. Um, There's kind of two schools of thought there, and we'll, we'll get into that. And in um, maybe it would be a good idea to have the next slide. Nope, I'm going to not the next slide. Um, 
There's some tools that will focus specifically on things like XML and JSON and do that fairly well because you're modeling the raw uh, XML, which is hierarchical, right? So when you're trying to, there's also ER modeling tools, you know, your, your, your typical um, entity relationship modeling tools. They can either import or ex export XML, but there's always a compromise, right? And, and if you've heard me speak before, you know I'm a big fan of not being too academic about this, of, yeah, there's a UML class and there's a, there's a relational table and there's an XML schema and, and there's enough information, maybe it's the 80-20 rule, there, you know, there's a, some core information that you're still talking about customers with a name and address. Could we somehow reconcile those or rationalize them into a single source? So that's a bit what some of the data modeling tools do. They're going to try to mush this into a relational table, which is just not the same thing, um, which is not good nor bad. That's just what they're doing because that's what they're a tool is. Some, to be fair, tools are um, do a little bit of both. Um, but when you think about this, is almost a one-to-many relationship um, with, the re with, with the resource being the one and then the, the works uh, being a many. And there's different ways to model this back and forth, but it doesn't go so well the other way, right? Could an author be the author of two um, resources, you know, I'm trying to say, I'm going to sleep last night, but um, it tends to go one directional with the, the parent being the, pa the parent of the hierarchy being the parent of the relationship, and the e ER tools tend to do it the same way. Um, there's different ways you can do that, but um, that tends to be the assumption. Okay, so the XML schema is, is good. It's good because it can tell you the schema of it without having the data in it. It tells you some basic physical structure. Um, but as I kind of hit on before, is that name field required? What's the definition of what we mean by by name? Are there code values when you might mention that there was, um, what I have, Boise, Idaho. You know, do they put Idaho? Do they put ID? You know, all that stuff we're used to in a nice data model or a relational database, um, they don't have. Or can you use a complex data type, right, not just string? Um, so I want to kind of talk about this, and I've shown this in other slides too, this kind of idea of a pyramid. There's different levels of data modeling. So the XML schema can just define physical metadata, the physical structure of, you know, format. It really does not have much business or metadata. So you're not going to have the business rule behind, you know, how the, um, I don't know, price is calculated. Or, or the, what the business, what a customer is, and how it relates to account, and can a customer have more than an account? It doesn't have that. That that's really where you add that logical or even conceptual layer on top of that. Doesn't mean it's bad, but that's not what it was designed necessarily to do. And that's where it is helpful often to integrate with something like um, a fuller data modeling tool or metadata repository to kind of add that on or source your XML from that even better. Um, so this is some of the context that's often last, uh, lost. And yes, there's yet another metadata, uh, data modeling cartoon, right? So from the same book. Um, and, and if you've you know, done any development in the past, you might get a giggle out of this. I know it's a data modeling cartoon, so I'm not expecting a full, full laugh, but maybe a giggle. Um, okay, we're almost done with our user acceptance testing and everything looks great with this new marketing application. Just one small question, what's the customer, All right? And we can laugh at that, but I have worked for and worked with huge organizations that have not made that uh, distinction and made very expensive and embarrassing mistakes, like sending renewal notices to prospects who haven't brought the product. Or I get this all the time from my bank, right? I get a, um, I have a credit card and then they keep saying, get this new credit card at a lower rate than I already have, right? So they, they can't figure out that I'm already a customer and they're sending me a mailing notice to a prospective customer, right? So all the stuff that we spend a lot of time with in metadata management and data modeling, that's just not what XML necessarily has. So, um, you can see some examples. Can a customer have more than one account? What kind of customer is this? Um, do we assign, assign the ship to address to the customer or is that maybe assigned to the account, right? All these kind of things, valid values, that's not going to be in your XML file. Um, because you can almost see the XML file filling its eyes. Dude, that stuff isn't my job. I'm just sending the purchase order, right? <laughs> Sometimes it's good to remember that, what XML was defined for and the beauty of it and the power of it and why it has become so popular. It is really a, a data exchange. So I'm trying to send the purchase order from company A to company B. I'm trying to order something online. Um, this is very good. So that idea of modularity and simplicity is the sort of power of it. So it comes with pros and the cons. It's just how you use something for its design purpose. Um, so that is why often XML is used in conjunction with a relational database for that sort of permanent storage and integration, um, or if you want to have that with your operating system or your operational or your reporting or your reference data. Um, you could, as I mentioned, um, often export from 
relational database to XML and vice versa um, because they're fit for purpose things. Um, here's one way I'd kind of talk about this a little bit, but you can. You can take an XML schema and generate DDL from it. Um, so you can see here in the example um, that if, if I have the resource table, I can create a, a table called resource with, with, you know, and you'll notice um, that they're all text fields right now because, again, you have that very limited data typing in XML. Um, it will create an author, et cetera. So you can. Um, there is a translation with kind of caveats that I, I had mentioned earlier. Um, and again, some comparisons between what we might say an XML diagram with its sort of native modeling XML as a hierarchy, and then some of the, some of the compromises that might be made um, when you, you put that into a relational model. Then you have to make some design decision. In this case, it is sort of doing that in many to many with, you know, I have a resource and an author and you can have more than one. But there's some design decisions um, that can be made. It isn't necessarily a direct translation because they, again, they're designed to be different things. One's hierarchical and one's not. Okay, so that was a little bit about XML. Hopefully that was some thoughts that were helpful. When we talk about JSON, um, some folks think of it as a mo more modern version of XML. Some think, well, a slightly different use case. We'll leave the jury out on that. Um, but similar, it's the JavaScript object notation, and it's a minimal readable format for structuring data. Um, and again, primarily to transmit data between a server and a web app um, as an alternative to XML. It has some other use cases I've seen as well, but we'll talk a little about some of those. Um, so it's very, you'll see an example on the left is an example of the same thing. Um, we have a list of our employees. So we have Shannon and Anita and Tony, you might, you might recognize those names. Um, so it's the same information one showed in JSON and one showed in XML. So you can make your choices. I tend to think JSON is a bit easier to read here on the left. Um, it's just more concise if you're programming world. Obviously, it comes from the JavaScript. Uh, you might be more familiar with that, and I was a programmer too, so um, I kind of like the look of that, right? One of the things that can be very annoying when you work on an XML file, these get huge, right? Because just think how long this took with these hags, you know, these hashtags, I mean, the element tags. Um, this is the way they're broken out. Uh, but similar to XML, it is sort of self-describing, so that you see that this is a first name and a last name right there with the data. It does have that same hierarchy, um, and it is simple and interoperable, so it still has that same design. Um, it is different. Um, you can do things like arrays. Um, it can, you know, the idea that it can be parsed with things like JavaScript, um, and as I already mentioned, kind of design-wise, it can be seen as simpler and shorter to write. That's always difficult to say because everyone has their preference, right? You could look at the one on the right and say, no, I like that, because you can see it looks almost more like a table. It's more structured. Again, there's different ways of doing things. Um, I will let you decide. I should have taken a poll for that, see who, who likes which one better. Okay, so similar um, to the XML, there's this idea of a schema uh, with JSON metadata, and there's an example. You might have had a JSON-based product catalog. Um, so you have sort of a, um, an ID, a brand, a price, and kind of an optional set of tags. Um, I see it as a bit more advanced than some of the things you can do with XML. Um, so here on the left, you can have your, your data, right? And that can be um, a little confusing to folks because it's kind of a mix of metadata too, right? You, have, you can obviously see that this is an ID, a brand, a price, and you can do things like tags, like a metadata tag, right? So that I can say that this information is, has to do with camping and sports because it's a super cooler, maybe something like a cooler you put water or beer or something in. But still, you don't have the full context, right? You could say, well, can the ID, you know, the ID contain letters? Well, you'll see here that the typing is a little bit more advanced here. You can say, oh, yes, it's an integer, um, whereas, you know, the brand is a string. Uh, you can put things like description um, here as well. Um, and you can do things like, um, you know, it's just required. So, yes, you can say that the uh, brand is ID is required. Um, so a little bit more robust than some of the things people traditionally do in XML, which can be very nice. So one of the use cases um, that's become popular with, it, with JSON is this idea of a document database. Uh, they often use the JSON documents to store the records or the um, collections in, in their databases. So one of the rise in the popularity of things like a document database is that idea of the ability to store unstructured data in a flexible way. Um, so if you think back to the idea of XML, it's um, extensible, right? So in one version, you can have name and address, and the 
when you have name address number, and it's not going to break things. So similar idea with document databases. And one use case might be I'm a museum, right? And I have all this stuff about China. So in one sense, I have this nice, beautiful vase or vase, as we say, it, um, that comes from China, and I can do a, a search on that. I also have some great books in the um, in the lobby that have some information about China, and you can see that that field matches. But everything else about it is different. One's an artifact, and one's a book. Um, one has things about you know, what medium it's done in. Is it ceramic? Is it cloth? Is it paint? Right. The other one has a title, which may not make sense for other works of art. Um, so that's one of the beauties of a document database, and why they have become more popular is that idea of the kind of flexible schema, and J JSON can do very nice things with that. So that's kind of why those two things fit very nicely together. Um, a little bit of a jump, but not too much. Um, so jumping back a little bit to a different topic is this idea of the semantic web. Um, so there's this idea of the, the resource description framework, RDF, that really um, helps drive a lot of the things in the web. So back to the earlier point where I had the kind of the internet interweb, right, <laughs> of a thing to thing and how XML is sort of shared that the data exchange between them. Well, that's sort of thinking of a server to a server, kind of sharing data between them. The goal of the semantic web, and we should like this as data people, is that you're trying to share data so that it's data to data. And they're trying to make, and this is kind of that second bullet here, the goal is to move from a web of documents where you have a URL, and you just go URL to URL, to a web of data so that you can actually see what's in that URL and add some semantics and some contextual meaning. Um, so it, I guess you can think of it as a, a data model of sorts, a very simple one. So you basically have subject, object, predicate here on the left. And it could be something like Acme Publisher is the publisher of RDF is easy, right? And it's really limited to that because you're trying to see you know, basically the, just the basic current connections between them. So these are sort of, if you think of graph databases, right, thing related to thing, and trying to see connections between them. And we'll get into some things like vocabularies, and there is a vocabulary, friend of a friend, right, so you can see who's, who's related to whom. Um, that's kind of the power of some of this. Well, there's certain serialization formats for this, and you'll see that there's an RDF XML, the common one, there's also a JSON, right? So when you're thinking of the exchange format, um, this is a very good use case of where things like XML and JSON on are are used. Um, so there are things like vocabularies or schemas to describe what's in that. Um, to you make friendly words, things like the Dublin Core or schema.org. Um, and again, this is adding some of that semantics and context around the very web itself. Um, and again, this is an idea of creating a web of data rather than a web of, of documents. Um, and this is an example I've stolen from Dataversity so they can sue me. No, just kidding. It's actually out there. You can do it yourself. You can go to the website and right click and say view source and you can see some of these examples yourself. Um, so here's an example of, okay, so last year we had the Enterprise Data World Conference. Hopefully some of you went there. Um, and it was at a place, right? It was at the Sheraton San Diego Hotel and Marina. So what the, the code on the left is saying, um, this was taken from schema.org, um, one of the vocabularies. There's a thing called, or a type of thing called a place. Uh, that what, what are some common things about a place? It's going to have a name, it's going to have an address, um, a postal code, etc. Um, and those are the common things that define placeness, <laughs> if that makes sense to a modeler. All right, well at that conference, and I was um, lucky to be there, I took a picture in the upper right. Won't win any awards for that picture, but I took a picture and say I posted this out on my website. Um, or Twitter or something, right? There's certain tags around that. But had that had if I had this on my, my website, I could put um, some of this code in there to uh, this one is not real. I made this one up. The one on the left is real. You can go look at that. Um, I could say that there's a type of a thing in this website called a place, uh, and you'll see there's some of the same field: the name, address, etc. Um, and so, why is this important? Maybe I'm trying to find out everything that's happening at this certain place here in San Diego Ma Marina. The place stays the same here, right? What I'm interested in is the place. Um, and I know that there's a conference at this place, and I have an idea what it looks like because there's a picture about the place. That's making it a web of data, right? So you could have had that this is an event, and you might have wanted to know everything about data events, and that might have been a different um, type of data if that makes sense. So it's sort of giving meaning to what's on that web page, um, and then you can do sort of 
smart queries around that um, because you're saying, tell me everything about a plate, tell me everything about speakers, tell me everything about a book that might be referenced on that. Um, and, and the authors of the website can kind of put that in there to help a, help their search results um, and help provide more information. So you may be familiar with uh, Dublin Core. And that's a common set of metadata standards for things like media and books and that kind of thing. So it creates this kind of standard for have a title. You know, what are the things about a work of, um, I don't want to say art, but you know, a, a literary work um, that has a title and a subject and a description, et cetera. And again, um, you'll see that some of the resources can, can be described in things like XML. Um, this example on the right is not an XML, but it gives the idea of, of what it is. See, I post, what do we do on the internet? We post pictures of cats. Right? <laughs> so if I wanted to make sure my picture of a cat got out there, um, I could create um, a resource description and kind of say, well, here's the title of my favorite cat video. The subject is cats. A quick description of it, you know, that it's a video and not a book, what language it's in. I guess if my cat speaks English, it would be in English and publish it with cats online. Right? So it just gives you a little more information about that resource, uh, so that it just isn't a bunch of stuff out on the internet, but it sort of um, has semanticness around it. Schema.org um, is a, another popular one. Um, webmasters can use to mark up their web pages. Um, so if you haven't heard of it before, you should at least be impressed by some of the folks that have. Um, so, you know, it was actually created by a group of some of the search, search providers, things like Google and Microsoft and Yahoo and Yandex. Um, and these vocabularies are created by kind of an open community process. So there's a GitHub project out there. Uh, there's also a public mailing list uh, through the W3C. So again, they create these sort of types with certain properties and they're, um, again, you can describe them using JSON, um, RDFXML, et cetera. Uh, so again, what type of thing am I describing? Is it a, a place? Like we gave the example of the Sheraton um, in San Diego. Is it a type of person? Is it a creative work? Et cetera, et cetera. There's also certain extensions for certain industries, you know, uh, it's health, health, life sciences, auto, et cetera, because certain industries, again, if you think of the main purpose of things like XML is sharing between B2B and B2C, you probably want to have some, you know, at least shared uh, attributes and some commonality in your schema. Um, if you're going to be sharing information. Uh, there are other common schemas and vocabularies out there. Um, again, Dublin Core and schema.org are probably the two popular ones that come up if people are familiar with this and mention some. Um, there's actually a site, the Love site, the linked open vocabularies, and they kind of do a heat map of the different uh, helpful listings of them. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, and there's a website here if you want to go look, um, the friend of a friend, uh, that's again linking people to people. So when you think of social networking and that kind of thing, um, you can help with that as well. So in summary, um, XML are used for transport and interoperability of data, and, and that is what they're good at, and that's important to remember. Um, be, because they don't do a lot of the things we're looking for in a relational database and vice versa, right? So um, they are simple by design and that's what's good about them. That could also can be frustrating about them if we're, if we're familiar with products that have a lot more, you know, richness around things like metadata. They do other things like this idea of simplicity, modularity, and extensibility as well as being self-descriptive. Again, we, you know, we, we can as a data modeler, open up and say, oh, they just address. They don't say whether that's mailing address or PO box or, but we knew it was an address. Right? <laughs> that's a lot further than we would have been if we didn't have something like XML that's going to share it. Um, you, know, you can integrate with some of these databases, either translational with some of the compromises we mentioned to a relational database, or at some of the core storage for some of these, you know, NoSQL databases like a document database. Um, whether it's relational or uh, XML or JSON, you can still do graphical models. And that might be something folks aren't familiar with. I think often, especially with some of these, you're used to seeing kind of text-based format. But there are tools in the market um, that do that. Um, and for me, personally, as I, as I said, I am a visual person. So I like to see it that way. It kind of makes a lot of sense to me to see it. Um, it kind of a use case of some of these is this idea of a semantic web that turns the web from a web of documents really to a web of data and has semantic meaning around it. Um, a little bit about me and my company. We kind of uh, specialize in data um, data design and how that kind of helps businesses um, do what businesses do best. 
Um, here's me. If you want to contact, I do believe Shannon um, and Anita post all this information. So if you do want to contact me for any reason after that, feel, feel, please feel free. Um, a little bit of a plug. We do have a uh, metadata management course that goes deeper into some of these topics, which is available through the university. And another sh shameless plug um, is for our lineup next year. So we have already planned a full year of lineup. Um, our very next one is on January 26th. Where again, we try to do a mix. Uh, next time, we're going to be talking about enterprise architecture and how data modeling fits in with that. You can see throughout the list, there's a whole uh, wide range of different topics. Hopefully, you'll join us for one of them. Um, so without further ado, I will open it up to Anita or Shannon uh, for questions. Great. Thank you, Donna. Um, well, to answer the most common question we get, we will be sending a follow-up email within two business days with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session, and anything else you requested uh, throughout the webinar. If you have any questions, put them in the Q&A. We'll be working through those, and um, I'll give you a minute to do that. And in the meantime, I think we have a few. Uh, Donna, related to slide 14, um, do you know if uh, Irwin supports the XML modeling that you showed there? Um, what are we talking about? So I make sure I'll go back to the right 14. Um, well, in general, I don't generally like to talk. I think it was one of the ones. Um, so in general, I would just say I don't like stock products, but they, they generally do more of the translation model than, than to, they don't show a native diagram of XML, they're going to translate that into an entity relationship model. Uh, so Irwin is one of them because they sort of grew up in the ER world. They don't show native XML models. They're going to do that translation so that when you import um, XML, it's going to show up as sort of an ER rendering of an XML file, if that makes sense. Great. So um, I'm not seeing any more questions at the moment. I see one, um, and maybe it's more of a comment rather than a question. Because um, in my view, XML and JSON quote modeling doesn't make any sense. When we model something, it depicts a logical concept of the solution under consideration. More likely, you're referring to diagramming, which is not the same thing as modeling. Um, and wow, that's kind of a lot of different things. Well, I think that we could be a modeler and say, how do we define model, right? <laughs> so there's several different parts. Um, of, of modeling. So one is the very physical nature of modeling. I would say modeling um, is the structure of your data mate and the format. If we think back to that pyramid that I have, this sort of logical, conceptual, um, and physical modeling. I think uh, JSON and XML modeling do an excellent job of that physical layer. And if you're thinking about creating a data structure, which, you know, maybe 75% of a lot of people doing data modeling are using it just for that. So I think in that part, of sense, they're great. I think there's some also some design decisions of how you do that modeling and what makes sense and how you break up the fields. So in that sense, you're doing some design if you think of modeling as terms of um, of that. I would agree with you. It's not what we necessarily think of modeling in the kind of conceptual, logical, doing all the relationship and integration. But again, that's probably not what it's designed for. So um, I have some agreement. It's probably some clarification in kind of my view. But I, I would also agree. Some people think of modeling as diagramming. Um, and I did want to kind of make that point that if we think of modeling diagramming, which some people do, I mean, when I think of it as diagramming, often because it's easy to kind of do that design in pictures, um, you can do some of that with XML and JSON. I want to let people know because I think a lot of folks kind of think they're stuck in a text editor <laughs> when they're doing that, um, but there are um, solutions to that as well. Great, thanks. Are they? Are there any other emerging standards that might replace XML or JSON? Um, I am going to defer that. Um, you know, I think those are two uh, popular ones out there. I'm not following some of the other ones that might be. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, may, I am reading another one um, where it said, you refer to XML. In my company, we create an XSD, which is a common message format that is shared. Um, how does JSON relate to this? So um, XML is going to be the format. XSD is the kind of the schema, um, and JSON has a schema as well. And then I showed a picture as well. So they they have uh, their version of that as well. Sorry, I keep jumping ahead Sorry. of you, Anita. I get I, you can't trust me. I get excited about a question. <laughs> <laughs> um. There's a question, uh, where can collections and field definitions be captured? 
Are there better options than Excel? Um, I, I would say that's a good use case to use one of these modeling tools. Um, so some that model natively can, can track some of this information. When I showed the JSON schema, there was a field where you definitions. Um, and sometimes, depending on your use case, if you are integrating with things like a relational database, you can store them kind of in a relationship model. So if you just um, also, there's things like um, think of metadata registries. When you're thinking of some of these vocabularies, that is often where some of those, you know, on the web, uh, where some of these are posted as well. Um, we also have a question about healthcare. I'm not sure. Do you have any thoughts on FHIR? Um, I am going. I am not familiar with that, so I am going to uh, defer on that one as well. Okay, and then um, what is the best practice to translate from relational model to JSON format? Ooh, uh, uh, that's probably a, a bigger question than just this one topic. Um, I, I would go back to your, your use case. I mean, I think if it's already in a relational model, it's probably there for a reason. Um, I wouldn't necessarily start there if I'm building JSON, I guess was my rambling way of trying to answer that question. But often that is where it is. Um, so I, one of the things is to, what's kind of um, different with those is the idea of the relationships. So you're going from a ER to a hierarchy. Um, so you want to think through through those um, and see what makes sense. There, Actually, there was another data diversity webinar that went a little deeper. You know, sometimes it makes sense to break them up into separate documents. Sometimes you want to break it up into a hierarchy. That's maybe a, a general thought uh, of giving some thought to that is that relationships are just handled a little differently. Uh, you can have separate documents. You can have uh, embedded hierarchy. Sometimes it has to do with performance, readability, et cetera. So a couple of thoughts there, um, but probably a, a deeper webinar to do on that one. Okay. Are you seeing many people transform ER models to JSON uh, LD, or are most just starting with JSON text? I am seeing. I actually see a lot more. Um, I am seeing a lot more uptake right now from folks to going from relational data models to XML. I think. Uh, JSON is a little not as po I almost think there's almost two camps. I think a lot of folks in the programming world are a little more comfortable with JSON. So I have not experienced um, too much going to the JSON LD more of the other. But um, that would be okay. my answer to that. So I think that was one of the other one diagramming tool. Which I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of you again. Um, that's okay. I don't want to answer that because that's kind of a vendor plug, which I don't. Um, but there are. Um, but yeah, I, I would just, uh, my, I guess my general comment on that is that do take a look. There's some that have been out in the market. There's some categories. There's some data modeling tools that can export out. There are some native ones. And with the native ones, there are some that kind of grew up in the XML world and they're adding JSON. Some are native um, JSON. So there's also a difference. Uh, and most of them are kind of startup mode. Some are actually getting uh, this idea of the semantic way as well. O often. They do kind of focus almost by define a necessity on this physical layer. Um, take a look, a couple of them actually have, you know, this idea of, kind of adding the semantic layer as well. So. Okay. Um, can XML JSON data modeling replace ER modeling completely? And if yes, in what cases could that happen? Um, Oh, I, I don't think any technology replaces anything else completely. I think, as I mentioned in the call, they're kind of different use cases. So I, I would see XML more as, um, you know, data transport. I, I think ER modeling is good for ER. You're looking at kind of acid transactions, right? That, that's what what ER modeling is good for. I should have said this probably more succinctly in other presentations when I was thinking more clearly than I'm not doing today. Um, uh, ER modeling is good for what ER modeling was designed for, right? I want uh, transactions that are, are linked, and I have the, um, you know, the, the accountability for that. If, if you want to use something like JSON, the one example I gave was things like document databases, which is a very different use case than your traditional ER model. So I, often they're used in kind of complementary. I wouldn't say any technology is going to replace. I would probably still put my accounting system on an ER system, you know, a, a, a relational database. 
a lot of data warehouses. There's a lot of good reasons why folks are doing that because of the rollback, because I mean, a lot of the great things relational databases have. If I'm trying to do something behind a website or have a lot of multimedia, something like a JSON-based um, document database is an excellent thing as well. So right now, no, I, I don't think they would ever replace ER modeling completely, maybe as things mature, but I kind of doubt that because they're really, right now, different designs. But you know, that said, what, what we're seeing in the market with even big data databases becoming more, having relational features and more relational databases adding some big data type stuff, you know, things are merging. Um, but I guess my general thing is to think, think of the use case for it, and I wouldn't say any if a vendor tells you they're going to replace everything else. Just give some thought behind that. Of you know, often these technologies, a lot of the big companies I work with have a bit of each for the different use cases because they're 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 using it for. So, yeah, ER modeling has its place in, in many very right, excellent cases. Great, thanks. Oh, I I'm think sure, all I'm the other. Sure okay, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to wrap up. I was like, I could do the others in email if they uh, are any others, or did I miss them? No, nope, I'm not sure that you missed any. Oh, um, right. well, then well, thank you, Donna, for another great presentation and QA. Uh, I'm afraid, you know, it's all the time we have for today. So just to remind everyone, we will be posting the recorded webinar and slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and we will send out a follow-up email to let you know the links and other requested information. Thank you again for attending today's webinar. Um, thank you, Donna, for another great presentation, and I hope you all have a great day. Thank you.